trials that have been done, uh, a little bit of bit of review of uh, of the guidelines, um, and and kind of a uh, what to do with the out of trial populations, which I think will be the most interesting uh, aspects of, of of what happens in the future. So. Um, to take it back a step. Um, so on April 16th in 2002 uh, in, in Rouen, France, uh, Dr. Alain Cribier is an interventional cardiologist, uh, did the first TAVI in the world. Uh, this patient was a 57 year old gentleman in cardiogenic shock with multiple comorbidities. He had previous lung cancer, previous pancreatitis. He's gone inside to listen to this until the exit. Previous uh, aorto by fem, his EF was 12%. Um, and uh, he had tried balloon valvuloplasty that had failed. And this was a, a last ditch effort and, and it went well. Uh, and since then, um, TAVI has, has relatively uh, exploded, so to speak. Um, if we look at the, the left uh, chart, uh, this is from Jack last year. Uh, and this, so this is STS data. So American centers plus a few Canadian centers uh, contributing, looking at the, the number of TAVIs performed uh, in the black line and every year just continues to grow over and over. The, the blue line is uh, the number of surgical AVRs. So 2015 was the first year where uh, surgical AVR uh, since its inception has actually uh, declined. Uh, and the, the red line is combined procedures, uh, including AVR, so CAB, AVR, things like AVR, MVR. Uh, so uh, 2018 was the first year we actually saw a decline in, in combined procedures as well. And on the right hand uh, panel is uh, the textbook graph for a, a disruptive technology or technology that's really changing industry. And I think that uh, when you look at graphs like this side by side, it, it becomes pretty obvious uh, that this is definitely a, a disruptive innovation. So, so how did we get here? Um, so in 2011, uh, the Partner One trial was published uh, and this was done in high risk patients. This was uh, people with a STS score predicted perioperative mortality of greater than 10%. And uh, when they looked at a surgery versus TAVI in the first generation TAVI valves, there was no difference uh, at five years in terms of their primary outcome of death. Um, you took a look at the pivotal trial, which is uh, the same trial with a different device with the Medtronic core valve and uh, coming to the same conclusion uh, in high risk people at uh, at five years and, and no difference. The partner two trial was with the second generation uh, balloon expandable valves with the Sapien XT. Uh, and then they, they increased the risk profile of patients uh, down to an intermediate risk profile with a uh, STS score predicted perioperative mentality more in the four to 8% range and no difference. Uh, Sir Tavi, going back to the Medtronic uh, Evolute R and core valves in this, so they're second generation valves uh, and no difference. And you can see as the uh, patient subgroups uh, be begin to get healthier, the, the mortality with the procedure also starts to decline. But they, all of these trials have been done so that average age in partner was low 80s, partner two was still low 80s, despite being, you know, lower surgical risk. And then partner three is, is the first lower, or first major low risk trial with the, the Sapien 3 valve. Uh, and then this is also the first one to actually favor one versus the other. But, but the, the point to make is that um, with the combined outcome, there, there's a superior and non-inferiority favoring of TAVI, but in no individual component of that combined outcome was any one statistically significant over the other. So death, you know, when you look at death alone, death wasn't statistically better for TAVI or SAVR, stroke wasn't better for TAVI versus SAVR. Um, and then Evolute Row Risk with the Medtronic Evolute Pro Valve, uh, their third generation valve. Uh, death and disabling stroke. Um, 
was not significantly different between the groups. But the key to understanding is that these are a highly selected cohort of individuals. These aren't real world patients. <clears throat> so I have uh, here, uh, for example, just the exclusion criteria for the partner three trial. Uh, there's about 30 different uh, exclusion criteria. And um, this, this heavily controls uh, who can enter the trial uh, to give you know, their devices their best results. Um, and so, like I said, these aren't real world patients. And uh, so we have to look to, to other things to determine who should get TAVI, who should get SAVAR. Um, once we start entering these, these out of bounds uh, areas or out of trial populations. Uh, so the guidelines give us a little bit of recommendation. Uh, there's relatively new uh, AHA guidelines from last year that uh, touch on this topic. So, so they, uh, they state that SAVR should be favored in people less than 65 or a life expectancy over 20 years. Uh, for symptomatic patients 65 to 80, after a discussion with the patient, uh, they should um, be able to uh, decide uh, TAVI versus SAVR. Um, and then for symptomatic patients uh, over 80, uh, or a life expectancy less than 10 years, TAVI is probably uh, is uh, appropriate should they be a, a reasonable candidate. Um, the PARTNER-3 trial was the only trial that included asymptomatic patients uh, and they found no difference. So, um, but that was only in patients with reduced EF. So, so that the same arguments for TAVI or SAVR uh, in their mind apply uh, in that population. However, uh, all other asymptomatic indications for aortic valve intervention were not tested in any of the trials, uh, and therefore SAVR is still the current gold standard. Uh, and then <clears throat> there's also the, the question of futility. Should you uh, do anything, who should you do nothing at all? Should you need neither TAVI or SAVR? Uh, and generally, if, if life, predicted life expectancy is less than a year, and we'll go through a few more details a little bit later than then probably in, uh, involving your palliative care colleagues or uh, involving uh, a, a cardiac palliative care program um, is probably a more appropriate, uh, appropriate response. Um, and then who do you offer uh, non-transfemoral uh, AVR to? And in, the, for example, in the PARTNER2 trial, uh, when they compared uh, subgroup analysis, compared surgical AVR to alternative access TAVI, surgical AVR was actually superior in terms of, you know, uh, important outcomes like mortality. Uh, so, so these are patients that probably uh, alternative access should really only be employed if they're truly not a, a surgical candidate or prohibitive risk. Um, the ESC or EX has responded to the AHA guidelines with their own. Uh, this year, and uh, they set the threshold a little bit higher. They think they, they uh, suggest surgery in people uh, under 75 uh, and low risk, uh, or in people who are unsuitable for transfemoral TAVI. Um, so TAVI is recommended in people over 75 or over, or for sure high risk, and then intermediate risk becomes a, more of a gray zone. But SAVI or SAVR, surgical AVR or TAVI uh, is, is recommended uh, for patients based on individual clinical, anatomical and procedural characteristics. And this will be the, the, the focus of my talk in that um, it is often not a straightforward decision. Um, quite often it is if they're 90 years old and uh, kind of living in long-term care, but quite symptomatic. Um, these are patients we traditionally wouldn't operate on. Um, and, and, you know, if TAVI, if they are a suitable anatomical TAVI candidate, then, then they go straight for TAVI. Uh, but there is a lot of patients who are in a gray zone. Um, and so at the end of the day, no study at any risk group, whether that's high risk, intermediate risk, or low risk, has shown superior, superiority between TAVI or SAVR in any individual MACE outcome, death stroke or MI. Uh, 
So, so the way I like to think of it is uh, surgery is better in a t uh, surgery is better than TAVI in a bad TAVI candidate. And likewise, TAVI is better than surgery in a bad surgical candidate. And, the, you know, we do have to take a step back and realize that this, this is even in high risk patients. So <clears throat> this has led to more common sense decision making. The CCS put out a, a position statement in 2019. Um, and uh, this is, a, I think, a, a pretty good chart uh, in terms of things that favor TAVI versus, versus SAVR. So if, if they're you know, quite old, over 75, frail, limited mobility, they, they favor, favor TAVI. And, and that's the general trend. And I think that's where TAVI has, has truly expanded. Um, if, uh, if they have a small, small annulus and you're worried about patient prosthesis mismatch, you definitely get higher gradients uh, and uh, a lower EOA with a surgical valve. So, so TAVI is often better. If you're concerned about their longevity, this kind of links back to frailty, then, then things favor TAVI. And if they have unfavorable surgical anatomy, if they have porcelain aorta and you can't clamp the aorta or they're, you know, redo surgery with patent grafts uh, running just underneath the sternum and they're high risk for getting it into with a, with a sternal saw, then, then obviously if they're a TAVI candidate, uh, this decision is relatively easy, or often relatively easy. Um, and then there's there's things that make people um, easy uh, easy decisions for surgery as well. So if they have unfavorable root anatomy for TAVI, for example, if they have either no calcification to hold in that that stented valve, or if they have excessive calcification. Uh, so in Ottawa, we use a, a cutoff of a calcium score greater than about 5,000, where we, we would tend to go prefer surgery due to increased risk of paravalvular leak, increased risk of rupture, increased risk of valve embolization. And so that's, that's been the general cutoff uh, in terms of excessive calcification. If their annulus size is out of range, this is relatively rare. Um, that they, they don't fit any of the valves available by the company. But, you know, last week we did have a pre or patient presented with uh, a valve area of 10 centimeters squared that is significantly outside, the outside of the range of a traditional TAVI valve and would be very high risk for, for embolization as well as pelvic leak. And they were obviously sent for surgery. And then if your coronary height is below about eight millimeters, uh, from the plane of the annulus, you're, you're anatomically, the risk of cornea obstruction is very high and you're probably better suited with surgery. If you have advanced uh, AV uh, block, uh, particularly uh, if you have a right bundle branch block, uh, and in Ottawa, when they looked back at their own results in patients with right bundle branch block, the rate of pacemaker after uh, a TAVI in a right bundle branch block was about 50%. Um, you know, in an 85 year old, will you accept this? Uh, yes, but uh, if you're, you know, you have a 65 year old, uh, the consequences of uh, potentially needing uh, long-term pacing um, definitely change the, the risk profile of that procedure and, and do make you have to have a, uh, discussion in terms of uh, surgical consent and and uh, this has to be brought up um, to give the patient the uh, a true sense of the consequences of of choosing one or the other um, as I said before uh, surgical AVR generally has a mortality benefit in previous trials over alternative access TAVI um, so if uh, transfemoral access is, is not possible, then, uh, then, then it generally favors SAVR. And none of the trials uh, previously have involved bicuspid valve patients. There's registries of bicuspid valve patients that show um, that their risk is a little bit higher. And I'll talk to them about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, bicuspid valve patients uh, typically favor SAVR. Uh, and then pure AI patients, uh, I will talk about later, but these patients generally favor SAVR <clears throat> as well as endocarditis. You don't wanna be putting a new prosthetic valve inside a infected uh, old valve because you're just gonna reinfect the new one. 
um, in terms of contraindications to one versus the other that force your hand. Um, like I said, the AI, bacteremia, uh, one that we often don't think about um, at the time of consultation is intracardiac thrombus. So you have a patient coming in with an EF of 15% and a burnt out ventricle from severe AS that is relatively, um, that, that it was undiagnosed. You have some, some thrombus in the apex. When you're putting a, a stiff wire down uh, into the LV uh, apex, uh, you're at very high risk of dislodging that uh, clot and sending off a stroke or causing a stroke or MI or something. So um, then this begs the question, uh, you know, if you think that patient is truly a TAVI candidate, do you, uh, do you uh, proceed with uh, a period of anticoagulation and then bring them back for TAVI? Or do you, uh, um, undergo a, a surgical AVR at that point where you don't have to dislodge the valve. Um, in terms of specific populations, CKD patients, TAVI is associated with a lower rate of AKI and dialysis. Lung dysfunction patients, TAVI is associated with a lower uh, related respiratory complications. So in patients with severe COPD, they probably do better with TAVI. Um, <clears throat> TAVI has a lower procedural risk uh, in patients with uh, liver disease due to less bleeding. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, in peripheral arterial disease, probably better with SAVR. If the patient has moderate or severe uh, MR, then this becomes a bit of a gray zone. If it's primary MR, uh, that's usually not going to get better with uh, TAVI and LV remodeling. So traditional AVR, MVR is preferred. Uh, in secondary MR, this then becomes a gray zone. If it's severe, they should probably go for surgery because remodeling alone is probably not gonna correct that. But if they have moderate MR, generally our practice has been to do the TAVI uh, and observe them over the next six months. Uh, and quite frequently their MR will improve um, just by decreasing or offloading the LV. Um, <clears throat> in terms of low flow, low gradient AS, um, these are high risk surgical patients, low EF. Uh, so typically better with TAVI. However, if they don't have contractile reserve, this really brings up the element of futility. And then in terms of pure AI, SAVR remains the gold standard. TAVI is really only in extraordinary cases. For example, we have a 97 year old uh, who has uh, been in and out of uh, hospital every two weeks over the past six months. Uh, with heart failure admissions and needing thoracentesis. And this is somebody that you may try uh, TAVI on for pure AI, just purely for symptomatic benefit. Um, <clears throat> bicuspid or valve, like I said, uh, surgery remains the gold standard. In structural valve deterioration, um, TAVI is an option, but the problem is that it usually requires at least a, a 23 millimeter valve done at the initial surgery to not have severe uh, patient prosthesis mismatch or significant gradients uh, after. So it, it is an option, but it, it does require the initial surgery to have put in a larger valve. In terms of uh, bicuspid aortic valve, like I said, these people tend to have bulkier calcium and a higher point of coaptation. Uh, so they're, they're subject to higher paravalvular leak uh, and uh, mortality, as well as a higher pacemaker rate. Um, <clears throat> and you can see in the graph on the right, sorry, it's a little bit small, but if their calcium is above kind of the medium, median level, uh, so if this study uh, looked at a calcium volume greater than 382 millimeters cubed, all of a sudden their mortality with TAVI goes from 6.5% at three years to 20%. So the calcium burden is a significant player. And then just kind of finishing up, uh, looking at a couple kind of clinical conundrums that, that we are facing now is, is decision. So the first one is what do you do in the low risk younger patients who do not want a mechanical valve? Um, do you do a primary SAVR uh, and then uh, uh, traditionally a valve and valve taver. And this is kind of the current uh, standard or current thinking. Uh, 
you have a younger, lower risk surgical patient, so their surgery is, is easier. Um, but then valve and valve has its own set of complications. There's increased subclin subclinical leaflet thrombosis, higher mean gradients and higher patient prosthesis mismatch. Or then you do you start with the TAVI uh, and then do a primary sternotomy uh, surgical AVR, you know, 10 years down, five to 10 years down the line when, when their valve uh, has uh, deteriorated. And so this removes all the disadvantages of a primary <clears throat> Uh, of, the, of the other approach in that you don't have that thrombosis. You get better gradients because you're cutting out the TAPI valve to sew in the new valve. Uh, but then it also has its own difficulties in that coronary reaccess, if they develop coronary ischemia over the period that they've had that valve is much more difficult with the TAPI valve in place. Uh, often this, the device explantation is much harder in, in TAVI or if they've had a pre previous TAVI valve. Uh, and then patients are older and higher risk when they do go for surgery. And then currently, what do you do with the coronaries if they do have concomitant coronary disease? The ischemia trial we know showed no benefit uh, to intervention in, over the short term, only at three years uh, in stable ischemic heart disease. Um, and then in partner uh, two, despite significantly different rates of revascularization between TAVI and SAVR, five-year mortality was no different. Uh, but like I said, uh, if you do TAVI and lone coronaries are much harder to reaccess if they do have an ischemic event. Or do you do TAVI or PCI, or do you do, uh, send them for bypass and, and coronary bypass grafting uh, and a surgical AVR? So, so just uh, briefly um, kind of reviewing what we're doing, what's the general uh, consensus at the Ottawa Heart Institute where I'm doing my fellowship. In people uh, over 65, if they're suitable for both uh, surgical AVR and TAVI, uh, generally uh, people are given the choice, but uh, TAVI has become first line. In low risk bicuspid aortic valves in age less than 75, uh, basically, uh, everyone goes for surgery. In intermediate or high-risk bicuspid aortic valves with calcium score less than 4,000, uh, they go for TAVI. In bicuspid valves uh, with a calcium score that are greater than 5,000, or a high-risk uh, RAFE calcification. So if you look at the, the picture I have here, the calcification pattern forms a T. And so when you inflate a new TAVI valve inside, it puts the uh, this aspect of the T becomes a sphere for puncturing the aorta and causing aortic rupture. So, so these patients uh, almost all go for surgery and less prohibitive risk. And their preferred alternative access sites, just for interest of the group, uh, typically is uh, our first choice would be a, a subclavian, uh, then uh, transcaval. Then they would do transapical if uh, a direct aortic then transcarotid. Um, I realized that was a, a lot in, in, in 20 minutes, but uh, I'm opening things to any questions any may, anybody may have. Perfect, Max, thank you. Can you stop sharing your screen? Then I think everybody will come back on, uh, on view there. Um, it's open to the audience. If anyone has a specific question, if not, I do have some questions. So I think Vern had sent me a text regarding bivest bicuspid aortic valve, I think it, you've answered that. My question is more around, you know, around the saying no. Uh, it, it's, it's obvious to me that, uh, that it's not that clear out there that while threshold has gone lower for us to intervene, uh, it is a low risk intervention. I think we forget the life expectancy of patients as, you know, and so what kind of tricks do you assess you know, sometimes it's obvious when you see the bed bound, living in a nursing home, not able to mobilize that person, regardless of what you do, they're never going to live at a year. Uh, but sometimes it is hard. It is one of those decisions that you make that you're not going to change the life trajectory of that patient. So is there a particular strategy that you use in, in Ottawa to sort of assess those patients that, you know, how do we say no to these patients? Not that we can't do this, but that we shouldn't do this. Yeah, um, I think the first of all is you you need um, you need a collaborative approach. I think just hearing it from one person is often hard. Um, so in Ottawa, we they have a, a formal cardiac palliative care uh, cardiologist. So this she's done uh, cardiology and heart failure, uh, and then she went back and did an extra palliative care fellowship 
Um, and so she sees all those patients that, that we say are not anatomic candidates uh, and not surgical candidates um, and, and gives them kind of expectations and options of, of how they, you know, how medical therapy can still be helpful. Um, but, but at the end of the day, like, like you, you said, it is a very tough discussion. Um, but in my experience, many, it, it, it is relatively rare for most of the people in that scenario, I find are often, um, you know, severely elderly and, uh, are, are, you know, they, they're, they're worried about complications and, and getting things done. So if you highlight a lot of those aspects too, they're often, you know, they're at, at peace with it kind of. And, but like I said, you can be, you know, like, like you said, it can be in a very difficult situation and it can be very hard to say no, but um, at the end of the day, um, I think reiterating that this procedure will not make you feel better, uh, probably, especially if, for example, in the low flow, low gradient patients, um, it does kind of sway people a bit. Yeah, and my my uh, I, there's two questions from the chat box. One I think uh, from Sharif is uh, around AI and bioprosthetic valve. I think the bioprosthetic valve gives you the structure by which you can deploy a, a valve inside and hold. And that's the problem with primary AI is you don't have calcium to hold onto the valve. So I think uh, yes, a prosthetic valve. Uh, can receive a TAVR valve. Uh, the other question is around, you know, uh, if you've done redo TAVR, so TAVI into TAVI, and if, if you sort of what you've learned from that, is that something you guys have done in Ottawa? Because it's cer certainly something that we haven't faced necessarily that much here, but I, I'm sure it's going to come. So, yeah, so far we, we've done a few redo TAVI and TAVIs, and um, they they have traditionally gone virtually identical to a valve and valve. Um, there there hasn't really been any any difference uh, in, in in my kind of interpretation uh, regarding the the bioprosthetic valve. <clears throat> TAVI is actually a really good uh, option if, if if for structural valve deterioration, particularly with AI. Uh, we had a lady in cardiogenic shock a couple weeks ago, um, came into the OR on 0.5 of Levo, 0.3 of Epi, 10 of Dibutamine. Uh, like I said, in cardiogenic shock uh, from acute severe AI from a torn leaflet. And the valve seats really nicely against the, uh, the valve and valve. Uh, you know, that, that case would be a, a super high risk mortality. Uh, case in that acute severe AI setting. Uh, whereas with the valve and valve, um, she was off pressors within 48 hours um, and extubated kind of within 24 and uh, doing quite well. Max, do you think that applies to uh, a freestyle, a previous freestyle valve where there's not a stented valve that, that you can land your, your, uh, your TAVI in? So, so we, since I've been there, we've done one redo homographs, which is, is very similar to a redo free or, or one TAVI in homograft. Uh, they do have a higher uh, rate of embolization. The risk goes from, uh, you know, less than 1% up to anywhere between uh, up to, I think in the literature, about 5% in terms of uh, risk of valve embolization in that homograft or xenograft scenario. Um, so it, it definitely is option. The, the one we did went smoothly. It was very hard to determine where was the plane of the annulus because uh, the homograft itself, as it calcifies, all you see is the calcium of the homograft all the way down to the bottom, not particularly at the plane of the annulus. And you don't see the actual um, sinuses of Valsalva, it, it looks like a straight tube. So it, measuring the graft was actually kind of the hardest thing in terms of deciding what size of, of uh, valve you want to implant into that uh, homograph. So there, there is technical difficulties, but it's definitely doable. Perhaps, uh, Max, the last question I'll ask is one from Craig, and it is uh, around uh, the paper that came out in the past year regarding 
uh, SAVR after TAVI and the reported higher mortality. If I remember correctly, it's 10 to 15% mortality in that registry for surgical aortic valve replacement after someone's had a TAVI. Um, anyways, if you were to comment on that sort of, so how are they doing? Uh, you know, is that something in Ottawa you've seen? How many you've seen? Uh, obviously, it's a select group of patients of potentially high risk that have had TAVIs in the past. That's obviously why there's a 15% mortality. So, yeah, and I, and I think that the problem is it's, it's, it's what do you do with that data in that, you know, the vast majority of those patients or, you know, a large proportion of the patients that are getting explants in the, for example, explant TAVI registry are getting explanted for endocarditis, which are already a very high risk subgroup. Um, you know, they're, they're not, and then, you know, in the period that they were getting TAVI, that is, you know, partner one, partner two days, where you're doing intermediate or high risk, everyone's over 80. Um, it, it just becomes very difficult to, to know what to do with that data, because, you know, is this a, is this a high risk procedure? Or is this, you know, a, a lower or lower risk procedure in a high risk patient? So I will, I will close this now as uh, obviously we continue for a long time. So for those of you who are interested in contacting Max uh, after this, uh, I'm happy to share uh, some contacts. I'm sure he'll, we could continue with this and have more questions. Thank you everybody for joining today. We had a great audience. There's more than 40 or 50 people on this call. Uh, thank you, Max, for rounds and, uh, and uh, have a good day, everybody.